Good morning. We're going to talk a little bit about President Jackson. I had gone over this in the actual lesson today, and I do want to reinforce with everyone how important it is that you attend the online class when it's scheduled every day. It is going to save you a lot of time because some of the stuff we discuss is as a group. Now, Andrew Jackson is one of the more confusing and amazing presidents we've had in our history. Uh, so please pay close attention as we're going to be going over some of this information. And there will be parts where you're going to have to respond uh, by writing your response in the near part. And I do also want to mention at the end of the lesson, we'll know how to answer item E of your study guide, which has to do about Andrew Jackson. Jackson is considered a common man. He was born poor uh, when he was 10 or 12. It's just his mom, his brother, and him. And the British had come in and taken over his home, uh, if you remember the Quartering Act, and a British officer was, was staying there. Well, one day the British officer comes down, and he throws his boots at Andrew and his older brother and says, shine my boots, boy. Well, Andrew Jackson told him to go shine something else, and the officer did not like that, pulled out his sword, slashed him in the face, and the neck area, Jackson's going to have a scar the rest of his life. So already things are tough. Now Jackson and his brother are going to be sent to a prisoner of war camp. The journey is miserable. It's something like 40 miles. His brother dies on the way. This is how tough it is. Andrew Jackson, of course, survives. But what uh, is also created is an intense hatred of the British. He'll serve in the Revolutionary War on the part of the Americans. He'll become a military officer in the War of 1812. And that anger, that rage he had towards the British is going to come out in full force as commanding general at the Battle of New Orleans. He has killed or wounded on the American side 70 men. The British have 1,500. That tells you just how much out for blood Andrew Jackson is going to be. Now, as his time goes on, he will have a lot of political successes. Congressman, senator, a Supreme Court justice, but even before all that, Jackson is serving at a local level. Remember, he was born poor, but he did work his way up. Uh, and in his 30s, he's a local judge traveling the circuit. And one day, a man is accused of doing horrible defacing, demeaning things to a little baby, took a knife to terrible things. And they want to bring him to Jackson's court. In fact, Jackson orders this man to go to the court. The man not only refuses, but he brings a gun out and he says, any man who tries to take me, I'll kill on the spot. Well, the sheriff won't do it. He's terrified. Other men in town, or they won't join a posse. They won't go do it. Finally, Jackson calls the sheriff in. The sheriff says, well, if you're so high and mighty about doing it, you go get him. Jackson took that as a personal challenge. And as you're going to see, he doesn't do well with challenges. Uh, and he says, by God, I'll do it. Grabbed his gun, hopped on his horse, and on his own brought the man back. This is Andrew Jackson. The man later said that he could tell in Jackson's eyes, this is a man who would kill. So you don't mess with Andrew Jackson. Uh, he, he took things very personally, as we're going to see in later stories uh, about dueling and his wife. Now, in 1824, Andrew Jackson ran against John Quincy Adams, who had just finished his term as Secretary of State, sixth president of the United States. Uh, it's a big deal. Jackson gets more votes. When the Electoral College, however, is put together and added up, John Quincy Adams will be elected president. He will be the sixth president of the United States. Uh, people see this as rich versus the poor. This is unacceptable. And for the next four years, John Quincy Adams and his whole administration is discredited. It's called the corrupt bargain. Makes the Adams administration an absolute failure. And it also sets up this idea of the man of the people uh, as uh, someone who's going to have a heroic comeback in 1828. So... There's an open-ended question that you're going to do on your Nearpod. What specific story from everything I've told you so far stands out to you? Take a couple of minutes in your Nearpod, type that up. If you need to pause this, go right ahead. Let's talk about the seventh president of the United States. Now, Jackson, as we said earlier, lost a very controversial election, but in 1828, he comes back stronger than ever, and he crushes Adams. But there's a cost, and it has to do with his wife. Jackson had fallen in love with a woman who was divorced. That was controversial enough. Divorce in the 1800s almost never happened. And his wife, uh, Rachel, was uh, a sensitive woman. 
She and her first husband, it just didn't work out. The husband basically agreed to the divorce, and he said he'd take care of the paperwork. She went on her way, fell in love with Andrew Jackson, much older than her. And, uh, and that's important because Jackson, as much as he wants to be a political leader, he followed his heart. He knew this was going to hurt him politically. He didn't care. Problem is, the first husband, the now ex-husband of Rachel, didn't file the paperwork. Uh-oh. So Jackson's political opponents are going to use this as a huge weapon against him and his election effort in 1828, calling him a, a polygamist, insulting his wife to no end. Jackson wins in 1828. His wife had been through literal Hades for that year. Her honor, her integrity, her very name was destroyed. And on December 22nd, she dies of a massive heart attack. This poor man has to bury his wife on Christmas Day. And it's well known that he swears that he will get revenge on everyone he holds responsible for killing the love of his life. He does tend to take things personally. And, and by the way, he's going to do this. Uh, there's at least 20 duels that we know of in, in Jackson's life. Uh, this is a, a man of action. There was one time where he and a gambler uh, got into a duel. The gambler got to fire the gun first. Hit Jackson in the chest near his heart. Jackson went down on one knee, practically fell to one knee. Put his other hand, his left hand, on the wound, put pressure on it, stood up, took his gun, blew the other guy away. That's Jackson. He's going to spend the rest of his life in pain with the bullet literally next to his heart. But he does it. So... He does tend to take things personally. Some of his decisions are based on those emotional issues. And I think that's one of the reasons people like him. He is considered a common man because he did grow up poor. He isn't poor by this point by any stretch of the imagination. He's fairly wealthy. But he's a hardworking self -made. You see the picture here of General Andrew Jackson on a white horse, lifting his uh, hat up in triumph and victory. And he's trying to look like Washington. He's taking the image of Washington. Think about it. Washington, Southerner, self-made man, man who fought the British and who beat the British, becomes a great president. That's what Jackson is trying to get the image of. And he's going to use that popularity against Congress a lot. One of the things that he disagrees with is the current policy of who can vote. Now, at this time, only white men who owned property. So if you had property and you were white, you could vote. That's only about 6% of the population. But Jackson completely disagrees. He believes that voting rights should be for all white men. Now, before you get upset and say, well, what about all people? This is the 1820s. Let's keep that in mind. This is not the woke time that we have today. He's going to push for universal white male suffrage. He will make sure that more men, by the law, get to vote. And he, he uses this, these, this call for including more people into government, into voting, and his past history of being poor, growing up poor, so he could connect. Now, I want to be clear, at no point is he considered poor now, but it's that image of poverty when he's young, and it's the fact that he's saying, look where I made it to. You can do the same. We need to make sure you have the right to vote. Of course, Jackson is a Southerner. He owns a plantation, lots of slaves. He supports agriculture and farming, and he sees government as inherently a problem. Big government is bad government as far as he's concerned, is that it takes care of the wealthy. It benefits business, not farmers, not laborers. And so he's very much against policies that expand the role of government, and he hates banks. He's thinking back to Shays' Rebellion in part, which nearly caused a second revolution. And let's be honest, there's going to be a personal reason as well. The quiz that you're going to complete is also on your pod. Make sure you do that. It's on the same lesson. Now let's talk about banks. So if you go back a couple of months, we talked about this. The Bank of the United States was created by Andrew Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, excuse me, uh, in order to stabilize the American economy. It managed the government's money. Uh, it transferred money between states, between the federal government and states. Uh, and a lot of states in the South didn't like this. They saw it as anti-South, anti-farming. They saw it as a risk to their way of life. And so did Jackson. Jackson will declare that it's against the people, but there's another issue as well. Andrew Jackson knows that the person running the Bank of the United States 
is a man by the name of Biddle. The thing of Biddle is someone that supposedly made pretty harsh comments about Andrew Jackson's wife before she died. He's going to get payback. And so this political cartoon does a pretty good job of encapsulating the whole idea of the tension between North and South. Now, it's called the American system in the, after the War of 1812. Uh, Henry Clay, who's running the House of Representatives, comes up with it. The idea is we're going to increase taxes. We're going to use this bank and its investment opportunities to create more infrastructure, more roads, more canals, more bridges. The North and its business owners and, and interests love it. The South sees it as a, a terrible thing because they feel they're being taxed greatly, but they're not getting the benefit. As much as Jackson is against the bank, Jackson also has the interest of the South at heart because he is a Southerner. So because Jacksonian beliefs say that government should not be tied with money interests, that government should be kept small, that it should stay away from the economy, he wants to make sure government doesn't become too powerful, specifically a group like the Bank of the United States. It's going to take away our rights is what he believes. So, in 1836, the charter of the Bank of the United States is up. It's going to be an easy slam dunk. Remember, Congress is run by Henry Clay. Congress is run by people who are for the bank. Jackson would be a fool to take this on in his re-election year. And he does. And let's see how it works out for him. The biggest fight of Andrew Jackson's presidency was his battle against the Bank of the United States. In 1816... Congress had issued a charter creating the second bank of the United States. Bank stockholders all came from the elite classes of the Northeast, and they were appointed, not elected. The president of the bank was a Philadelphia aristocrat named Nicholas Biddle, and Jackson thought that Nicholas Biddle was operating the bank for the benefit of Nicholas Biddle and his buddies. Even though it was the sole repository for the federal government's deposits, the Bank of the United States remained a private institution. While paying out dividends to the government, it also made a profit for its stockholders. They didn't just simply take the federal deposits and stick them away in a vault. They take those deposits and they loan them out. And they make money by loaning those deposits out. And so the bank is making very, very good money at this time period. Jackson was the first American president to come from a poor background. Like many ordinary Americans, he hated the idea of a private bank run by a small number of wealthy stockholders. Jackson wanted to get rid of it, and he said he was going to get rid of it. And whenever Jackson said he was going to do something, he usually ended up doing it, regardless of the opposition. When the bank's charter came up for renewal in 1832, Jackson vetoed the bill, declaring that the bank was unauthorized by the Constitution, subversive of the rights of the states, and dangerous to the liberties of the people. With his re-election approaching, Jackson had staked his entire presidency on the issue of the bank. And it was a triumph for Jackson. He was resoundingly re-elected. He was a very popular man. So the Bank of the United States knew that it was toast. Once he was re-elected, Jackson took his revenge on the bank one step further. He decided to remove all of the federal government's deposits from the bank and place them in smaller local banks that he selected personally. His critics called them his pet banks. In order to do that, he has to have the Secretary of the Treasury remove the deposits. The first Secretary of the Treasury he goes to, he says, I want you to remove the deposits. And this Secretary of the Treasury was a bank man and said, well, I'm sorry, President Jackson, I, I, I can't do that. He has this person move to a different office. The second Secretary of the Treasury, a guy by the name of William Duane, comes into office. And Jackson says, well, Mr. Duane, I want you to remove the federal deposits. And Duane says, well, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I can't do that. And he summarily fires Duane. The third Secretary of the Treasury is Roger Taney, who moved over from the Attorney General position. And Jackson says, Mr. Tawney, I want you to remove the federal deposits. And Tawney says, well, yes, Mr. President, I'm happy to remove those federal deposits. And now Tawney wins as a result of doing this. He ultimately becomes Chief Justice of the Supreme Court when John Marshall passes away. 
Jackson's enemies in the Senate were so infuriated by what they considered Jackson's expansions of presidential power that they formed a new opposition party known as the Whigs. And with the death of the Bank of the United States came the end of an era of centralized control over America's monetary system. The following decades would be a time of laissez-faire as economic power moved away from the federal government and towards private businesses. Now, following this next section, you're going to complete a quiz online again on that same Nearpod lesson. So just make sure you watch this entire video and then go in and complete the activities. So we know Jackson has this image of fighting the bank. The bank is like a many-headed hydra. Uh, and every time you cut off one head, two shall take its place. So he's got to destroy it at its root. And that's the type of mythology we take from Andrew Jackson. The, the result was Andrew Jackson vetoes the bill to renew the charter of the Bank of the United States. He pulls all the money out. As a result, the Bank of the United States is essentially not going to be an institution that has any impact on this country for the next 80, 90 years, at least until it's brought back into being and given enormous powers later on in the, the Great Depression years. So the last question you guys are going to work on, and this is what you're going to do on your own because you didn't come to class. Answer all parts of the study guide questioning below based on what we've covered. How did Jackson feel about voters? That's a sentence. How did he feel about the bank? What did he think about the bank? Why did he not trust them? What did he do about the voters? And what did he do about the bank? So that's at least four sentences you should have. Um, hopefully this helps out a lot, and hopefully you will come to class next time. If you're having technology issues, you really do need to get those resolved. I've been mentioning we were going to go online since November. It's mid-January. It's past the point where technology can be used as a reason for you not to do stuff. So if you have questions, show up for the uh, support class, 1.30 to 2 o'clock. The join code is 760-760-Z, or just ask me during most classes at the end of the period. Thank you very much.